Hello, Andrew West here with you with Saturday Extra. Professor Suzanne Corey is one of Australia's most distinguished molecular biologists. She's also delivering the 2014 Boyer Lectures, and you'll be able to download or podcast them soon on ABC RN. Suzanne is in our Melbourne studios. Suzanne Corey, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. It's great to be with you. Now, this week, the chief scientist, Ian Chubb, released his recommendations for a national science strategy. One of the areas that he highlighted was the lack of students who were taking up maths and science. Do you have any insights as to why, you know, when we live in such a digital world that's been created by scientists, we have this seeming anomaly of insufficient interest or insufficient take-up of maths and sciences? I think one reason might be that schools offer a much broader range of subjects now than they did when I went to school. I think when it comes to the really tough mathematics and physics and chemistry subjects, it's easier to avoid them and still think that you're doing science. Well, you are still doing science, but those are really important grounding subjects that you need everywhere in science later on in your careers. So... Mm. I think it's really important to emphasise to students that they should aim high in the subjects in science that they do at school. I want to link science, though, uh, and and technology to the other humanities and social sciences because it it shouldn't be a sort of either-or binary, should it? I mean, I would have thought that medical science, for example, would benefit from uh, linking up with disciplines like anthropology. So, I mean, there there ought to be these connections both in the academy and in industry, shouldn't there? Absolutely. I think the social sciences and the humanities are vital. We need to understand how society works. They help us understand that. I, in fact, um, found it very difficult to choose between the humanities and the sciences at school. So I ended up doing two year 12, so I could do both. (laughs) (laughs) It was really difficult to make that choice. And I've retained a lifelong love and interest in the humanities. So yes, they're very important too. So when I'm saying that we need to emphasise science and maths education in our schools, I think that's true. But I also think those other subjects are of very high value as well. Sure. Look, let's get to the to the really gory stuff here, and that is uh, the current cuts to science funding. How clear-sighted is I'm this? I'm glad you <laughs> described them as gory because well, they are. Well, I'm just looking at the data here. The CSIRO, $111 million gone. The Australian and Research Council... And tremendous Council, number of jobs as well. Yes, $75 million from the Australian Research Council, $120 million from the Defence Science and Technology Organisation. That Yes, I mean, we're talking about big cuts here and asking governments to change their political priorities. Yes, we need to rethink this. We need to realise that the nations with whom we are competing for the economy, for economic prosperity, are investing now, have been investing for some time in long-term strategic investment in science and mathematics education and training. We need to do the same or we will be uncompetitive. Yes. Now, you're a molecular biologist and you're concentrating on cancer research. I mean, the one good thing you've got here, uh, the government's medical research fund, that must surely be some ray of light to you there. Oh, I think that's tremendously exciting. That is a vision of hope for the future. This is what they need to do in all areas of science. This is strategic, long-term investment that's going to drive this kind of science. But I have to add, medical research stands on the shoulders of all the other sciences. So it's really important that we use this funding wisely Mm. and invest in all the sciences that are supporting medical research as well as in medical research. And I'm not sure that our politicians understand that at this point in time. Yes. Is it true, uh, I think I recall you writing, though, that you're not entirely happy that this very generous medical research fund will come at the cost of uh, a co-payment for Medicare because I think you see some clinical implications there at the, at the primary health level? I cannot accept that we can jeopardise the health of the most vulnerable in our communities at the expense of the future, the health of our future communities. So I think it's really important to consider how that fund is funded. 
Suzanne, just as we wind up, uh, my colleague Norman Swan, not so long ago, had a terrific discussion about the US and the fact that there's a great number of private investors in scientific research there. There are lots of institutes and, and think tanks. Uh, is this something you think Australia should follow? I mean, is this is this a, a priority or ought it be a priority for our private sector and our philanthropic sector? It's not as if we don't have philanthropic support for research, especially in medical research. And from the very beginning, philanthropy in this country has played an important role in fostering the strength of our medical research. It would be great to do even more and to um, carry through with, say, further taxation reforms that encourage more of that kind of giving. And it would be really great to build up a really big research fund such as the Howard Hughes Medical Research Fund in the, in the US or the Wellcome Trust in the UK um, as, a, as an independent source of funding to the NHMRC that would greatly strengthen the system. There is, though, a new question that's now ar- arisen over this question of whether science is in the, the public good or the private interest. Uh, we've had this federal court case just in the past day or so that ruled that private companies do own the patent to human genes. I mean, that's an interesting debate now, isn't it? Uh, now given some sort of judicial direction. The um, case that you're talking about is about a patent over one particular gene that's very important in testing for breast cancer. This is the BRCA1 gene. The fight in the courts dates back for a very long time. On the one hand, you can see that genes are genes, they're part of nature. On the other hand, if you're devising a medical test or a new therapy for a, a genetic mutation, You've taken the knowledge about that gene a lot further. And it is very, very important that we have strong patents to enable pharmaceutical companies to survive. They expend huge amounts of money to develop new medicines. We would not have those medicines without a strong pharmaceutical industry. So I can see the arguments from both sides, but on the whole, I would have to come down in favour of continuing patenting, but in medicine at least, what is being patented has changed since those early days. And now the patents that are the most valuable and are the only ones that industry is really interested in are the use patents. So you have had to come a long way from the discovery of a gene or a mutation to the stage where you have used to that knowledge, and that might be, for example, a new chemical compound that's likely to be developed into a drug, those are the patents that are the most highly sought after and the most valuable now. And I think that's eminently justifiable. Even though your lectures are very capacious, you look at the areas where there are big warning signs in neon lights, you also uh, end with a bit of hope there. Uh, Where does Australia have the competitive edge in science research? I think we have the edge in medical research. I think other areas of great strength are astronomy, um, robotics, physics, chemistry, environmental science. We're very strong in environmental science. So we have because we're bearing the brunt of a lot of the problems, of course. <laughs> well, yeah. we also have our own unique environment mm. and we need to look after ourselves. Those are all particular strengths that have grown up because we've needed them to grow. It's wonderful to talk to you, and this is a terrific series of Boyer Lectures. Professor Suzanne Corey, one of Australia's most distinguished molecular biologists, Suzanne is delivering the 2014 Boyer Lectures, The Promise of Science, A Vision of Hope. Suzanne, thank you very much for being with us on Saturday Extra. Thank you, Andrew. Great to be with you. 